Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Caitlin Burke. Growing support for Hillary Clinton in her bid for the White House. President Obama has formally endorsed his former Secretary of State. And Donald Trump took to social media to blast the endorsement as the presidential race heats up. Charlene Aron has the story. Today, this is the video endorsement of President Obama's one-time rival Hillary Clinton, saying she is the most qualified candidate to seek the Oval Office. I'm with her. I am fired up and I cannot wait to get out there and campaign for Hillary. The announcement came shortly after the president met with Clinton's opponent, Bernie Sanders, at the White House, calling the senator from Vermont a patriot. Sanders, who's still in the race for now, says he'll work with Clinton in the near future to defeat Donald Trump. And a big endorsement from the left for Clinton that some liberals hope will win over Sanders supporters, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, often mentioned as a potential running mate for the former Secretary of State. Hillary Clinton won. And she won because she's a fighter, she's out there, she's tough. And I think this is what we need. Donald Trump reacted to the president's endorsement of Clinton on Twitter Thursday, saying Obama just endorsed crooked Hillary. He wants four more years of Obama, but nobody else does. The Clinton campaign tweeted back, delete your account. Even as the big endorsements came in, there was also a reminder of Clinton's lingering scandals. Just minutes after the president endorsed her, White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest admitted that the FBI probe into her emails is a criminal investigation. Clinton faces possible prosecution for conducting classified government business through a private email server. Ernest said the president's endorsement of Clinton wouldn't be interpreted inside the FBI as a signal to let her off the hook. The email scandal will also be played out on the big screen. The Hollywood Reporter says a series of films taking aim at the Clintons is set to hit theaters and online. The biggest may come from Dinesh D'Souza of the successful political documentary 2016 Obama's America. His new film follows the money trail at the Clinton Foundation. Meanwhile, the Clinton and Trump campaigns are gearing up for the general election in November, which is just 150 days away. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. The U.S. is stepping up its airstrikes against the Taliban in Afghanistan. After months of debate, the White House approved the plans in an effort to give the military greater ability to help the Afghans fight and win the war. 9,800 U.S. troops are currently in Afghanistan. However, they still wouldn't be involved in direct combat. The decision gives the military greater flexibility. However, they may only use their new authority in situations deemed to have a strategic and important effect on the fight. Israel raided metal factories in the West Bank looking for manufacturers of the homemade atomic we automatic weapons like those used in this week's terror attack in the heart of Tel Aviv. Known as the Carlo, they've emerged as weapons of choice for Palestinians. Two Palestinian terrorists opened fire with homemade automatic weapons, killing four Israelis and wounding 16 others. And as CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports, the attack drew uncharacteristic condemnation from the UN. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu praised international condemnation of the terror attack, but said the Palestinian Authority had yet to respond. I heard with appreciation the strong condemnation from the leading capitals of the world for these despicable acts of murder, but I did not hear such a condemnation from the Palestinian Authority. For the first time since the current wave of terror attacks began last fall, the UN Security Council condemned, in the strongest terms, the Palestinian terror shooting in Tel Aviv that left four dead and more than a dozen wounded. The council said those responsible for these killings should be held accountable. Any acts of terrorism are criminal and unjustifiable, regardless of their motivation, wherever, whenever, and by whomsoever committed. Israeli police were out in mass in Jerusalem during prayers on the Temple Mount on the first Friday of Ramadan. Here at the Damascus Gate, the mood was quiet, as opposed to the celebrations that took place here following the attack. Israel cordoned off the Hebron area village of Yatta and arrested an accomplice to the attack. In this video released by the IDF, soldiers are searching the home of one of the terrorists. Israel also canceled more than 80,000 permits for Palestinians from the West Bank, 
who had hoped to visit holy sites and relatives in Israel during Ramadan. Funerals for the victims took place on Thursday and Friday. But even as Israelis mourned their dead, they showed their resilience, returning to the Sarona market a day after the attack. Some sat in a circle around an Israeli flag singing songs. Politicians came too. These were not terrorists in brackets. These were terrorists who came to kill citizens and frighten Israelis and try to break their life cycle. And that's why we are here in Sarona to show that life continues as usual and we will not give up and we will never be deterred by terror. Netanyahu visited the site of the attack for a second time. Surrounded by incredible security, Netanyahu met the owners of the restaurant and sipped coffee in the trendy Sarona market. We will win. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. It's been a harrowing 26 months since Boko Haram terrorists kidnapped close to 300 girls from their school in Nigeria. Only a fraction have escaped. And one grieving mother has come forward with shocking details that a school administrator might have known about the planned attack. Abigail Robertson brings us the latest. Two years later, questions remain unanswered about the location and fate of the kidnapped Chibok schoolgirls. We just had gunshots in the night. Everybody was screaming, running helter skelter, looking for where they will find safety. My husband said, let's go. I said, I'm not going because my baby is in the school. She said, then he said, nothing will happen to them. The security men are there. But the next day, they found the school burned to the ground with no sign of the girls. Mary saw her daughter in the first video released by the terrorists, but she's heard nothing since. Last month, one girl managed to escape, reporting that all but six of the girls are alive. Half have been forced into marriage. We want them to put more effort of rescuing the girls. Now Mary is telling why she suspects local government officials knew about the abduction. According to her and others, the dangerous security situation led the boarding school to close for weeks leading up to the attack. Then, the principal suddenly called the girls back to school to take their finals. Mary says the principal and her two daughters were not at the school when Boko Haram struck, and none of the teachers, administration, or their children were taken. She has a hand in it. She knows everything about it. Mary also claims the governor showed his support for the terrorists by rewarding the principal after the attack. To my own understanding, he's their sponsor. If he's not their sponsor, he will fight against terrorism in the Northeast. But he's the one supporting terrorism in the Northeast. Mary continues to trust God that her daughter will return home and prays foreign governments get involved in the efforts to help locate and rescue the remaining girls. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. The U.S. is giving up control of the Internet. In the latest move, the Commerce Department has endorsed a plan that will give Internet oversight to a broader online community. A representative for that department says that the new model will put Internet monitoring in several hands instead of a single governmental body, and that it will ensure a, quote, vibrant and healthy Internet. They went on to say that the Internet's domain name system would continue to operate seamlessly. The plan comes in response to the government's 2014 transition announcement. Up next, in a nation where Bibles once had to be smuggled, Christian bookstores are now thriving. George Thomas takes us inside this daring outreach in communist China after this. Owning a Bible in China was once illegal. For decades, missionaries smuggled tons of Bibles and other Christian literature into the communist country. But now things have changed. George Thomas tells us why in this story from Beijing. This is a budding industry, just like the first light of dawn. In the world's most populous nation, there is still a lot of darkness here that is suppressing the light. Technically still communist and officially atheist, we have seen God open the doors 
And he wants us to be a light. Comes the story of a mission to reach China's masses with God's word. God wants us to be like the light of dawn. And as that light grows brighter, the darkness will recede. Joseph Tui is a pioneer of sorts. In 2004, he opened one of China's first legally registered Christian bookstores. Life was very difficult when we first started. The bookstore was practically sustained with money from many secret brothers and sisters in the Lord. Tui says Christian books were scarce and anyone caught with a Bible went to prison. Still, missionaries smuggled Bibles and other Christian literature into the country, putting themselves at great risk. Christians used to come to my bookstore in those early days, asking all kinds of questions like, do you have this book? Do you have that book? Do you have books written by these authors, that author? After hearing several no's, they would say, what kind of bookstore is this? Government attitudes began to shift about 15 years ago, when authorities noticed how many Chinese people were turning to Christ. This led to less restrictions on publishing companies. It also gave birth to a small industry of which Xu Qixing was excited to join. In 2002, he opened the first Christian bookstore in Shanghai called Stairs to Heaven. When we opened, we only had one book in each section of the shelves, altogether 50 books, each on the shelf with a gift product on either side. <laughs> We would feel so happy when one book was sold out. That same year, Chen Xiaoping opened her shop called Jehovah Nisi in the port city of Xiamen. We knew bookstores could be a very good platform to reach people, better than many other places because you get to know people's spiritual needs. Yue Gang also sensed a spiritual opening. He started small, in the basement of his house, and then, in 2002, opened what is officially the first Christian bookstore in Beijing, called Stream Bookstore. We got the name from Psalm 1, which says, if a tree is planted by the water, its leaf does not wither. Our bookstore is like a tree, which can only grow with God's watering and care. We invest a little, but our spiritual returns are many. Since then, Christian bookstores have flourished. There are about 250 licensed Christian bookstores today operating in China, but many of them quickly realized that in order to survive and thrive, they had to change technologically. My mother would ask me, you've been losing money since you started the company. What the heck are you doing? <laughs> but I knew I had to do it, despite the financial risks. In 2008, Wang Shaipei started the first online Christian bookstore in China. Like the others, starting out wasn't easy, but Wang persevered. I prayed about it for eight months. The more I prayed, the more I was sure of God's guidance. I knew the church and the gospel in China were rapidly changing, so it was the right time for promoting the ministry of the word. Christian bookstores have now become a place of active evangelism and outreach. In bookstores, you get to know all kinds of people from different places. You can help people connect with each other, make new friends and bless each other. We're not in this to make money. We don't have a high input-output ratio, but this is about an investment into the souls of men. Still, Xu and others say the Christian publishing door is not completely open, and significant challenges remain. Two years ago, Chinese authorities dealt a huge blow to Christian bookstore owners severely restricting the number of Christian titles that could be published each year. It dropped from 200 titles a few years ago to 80 last year. As of this year, the government has only issued 20 titles. The government is worried that giving us more publishing titles could greatly increase the number of Christians and could somehow impact social stability of our country. However, I think the authorities know that the growth of Christianity actually makes our society better and eventually they will change their attitudes. Despite these challenges, Wang and others press on, knowing God is moving in China. And all they have to do is to remain faithful. God will continue to hold us up by His grace. 
and hold us until we complete the great vision. George Thomas, CBN News, Beijing. Up next, we'll show you how this bakery is giving former prison inmates a second chance at life. A Virginia bakery has come up with a recipe for giving a second chance to women who have a criminal past. The program uses baking as a way to succeed in the kitchen and beyond. Charlene Aaron shows us how Together We Bake makes a difference. Patty Hunt is learning her way around this kitchen in Alexandria, a place that represents a new start for the former inmate. Being here has helped me to realize that I can go back out and make something of my life. Helping women like Patty is the goal of Together We Bake, an organization that empowers women with the tools they need for a second chance in life. Stephanie Wright, a former social worker, started the bakery with a friend just over three years ago. We knew there were a lot of women in need okay. in our area, so started doing lots of research, talking to lots of people about what our community was missing, and we realized that women really needed job training and support. They just needed to know that someone cared. The program provides hands-on training and personal development to give women experience toward future employment in the food service and hospitality industry. They spend a lot of time um, in the first part of the program in the kitchen, so they learn all about food production and food safety. They get their Serve Safe certificate. Apple chips, granola, and chocolate chip cookies are just a few of the sweet treats made here. Everything has a process. Um, I learn about the measurements of the cooking, what goes into the cookies and the packaging. Um, I didn't realize that when you weigh things and there's proportions just to make the product look perfect. <laughs> While baking is the key way that the women here at Together We Bake are empowered, the ladies also learn recipes for success for outside the kitchen. So good. Coaching classes help the women take on challenges such as finding work, building confidence, and dealing with family members. They learn about communication, conflict resolution, goal setting, all, the, all these things that really are necessary to be successful in life. And uh, through all of that, they really develop the confidence they need to believe in themselves, um, to complete something. A lot of the women will say, I've never followed through and completed anything. I start a lot of things. So when they graduate, they feel so proud and they really believe I can do anything I put my mind to. Kim Christian spent the last 20 years in and out of prison for drugs and shoplifting. I have to stop this vicious cycle that I've been in. And this program is helping me to get myself together, like, you know, to be in society, to, to live normal. Local markets, including Whole Foods, carry the fresh-baked goods, which helps to foster pride and accomplishment. I never thought in a million years that I would be putting cookies on the shelf in the store to be sold. It makes me feel so good to see our little shiny bags on the shelf, the granola we packaged, the apple chips we packaged, and I've never seen what we had in the store till I went there. The red bag stands out, our labels stand out. More than 80 women have graduated from the program, which boasts a recidivism rate of just 8%. About 60% of the women are employed, which is, is great. One of our recent grads from just about a year ago, she started her own baking business. In the end, women are empowered with knowledge and skills, along with the hope of a better future. It's almost like I'm giving back something, giving back to the community from all the wrong that I've done. This is a, a second, third, and fourth chance for me, and I thank God for it. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Alexandria, Virginia. Such a great program. I know I'll be heading out to the store to look for some of those cookies. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Well, the weekend is almost here, and if your plans include heading to the movies, Plugged In Online, Focus on the Family's Entertainment Department, is here with a review of the film Warcraft. For years, our world has been at peace. But something is coming. I can feel it. The fantasy
fantasy movie Warcraft tells of a struggle between humans and orcs. The hugely muscled orcs live in a world that's been consumed and corroded by a dark and powerful magic known as the Fell. And since their land can no longer sustain them, an orc shaman creates a magical portal fueled by the very life forces of the orcs' hapless prisoners. Through this portal, an army of deadly warriors attack the world of Azeroth, a human realm that has lived in peace for many years. But those mighty and fearsome orcs aren't all of the same mind. There are some, such as the young chieftain Duratan, who recognize their people's dire need while realizing that the shaman's foul and malevolent magic is the very stuff that destroyed their world to begin with. Why are you here? To save our people. Can there be a peaceful solution? A way of working with the humans and saving the orcs from this magical blight? Or has darkness already grown too strong? Based on a popular video game franchise, this driving action flick tells a clear-cut story of good and evil, a tale of heroes and self-sacrifice. And the movie packs in plenty of CGI spectacle to dazzle the eyes. However, it also packs quite a violent punch as warring humans and massive orcs slash, stab, crush, and kill each other in bone pulverizing ways. Add in the foul magic side of things, and I can only give Warcraft two and a half heavy sledgehammer blows out of five for family friendliness. For a full detailed review, visit us at PluggedIn.com. Plugging you into the movies, I'm Bob Olszewski for Focus on the Family's Plugged In Movie Review. That's it for now on CBN Newswatch. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.